I am a believer that the offseason needs some adjustment. The fact that we still have two pretty dominant starting pitchers out there and it's March 15th, it's partly the responsibility of the agent, Scott Boris, but it's also a mechanism of the system. Let's bring in FT, Senior Insider, Ken Rosenthal, to talk this out a little bit more. Ken, happy Friday to you. And what do you think about the Braves adding Adam Duvall? And we can cover both layers here, what it means for Atlanta and what it means for Duvall and the rest of the free agent market. First off, I know Alex Anthopoulos said they're not worried about Kalanick and they're committed to him and he does play great defense. And for all the reasons Eric just stated, he should succeed. That said, when you can get Adam Duvall for $3 million as insurance for Jared Kalanick, just in case, you do it every day of the week, and it gives them a deeper group. It just is such a positive move for them overall. He's had great success there twice now. I just like it from all of those perspectives. And I am a believer in Kalanick. I wrote a long story about him last April when he was really hot, and it seems to me this kid is extremely talented. He's also hard on himself, and when he gets into one of these ruts, he can get down on himself. So. He should thrive in that lineup, but right now, with the way he's going this spring, if I'm Alex Anthopoulos, at least I have a touch of concern in my head about what's going on. As for the market, we've seen what's happened here, Scott, and it's pretty clear. If you're going to sign now and you're not Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery, maybe even Michael Lorenzen, maybe even Mike Clevenger, you're getting $3 million, $2 million, $1 million, maybe $4 million like Kike Hernandez did. The money has essentially dried up at least from the team's perspective. So it's tough out there for the remaining free agents. There's no doubt about that. Michael Taylor, Tommy Pham, the two pitchers I just mentioned, a couple of other players as well. Brandon Belt is still out there. And it seems to me that if those guys are going to play, it's going to be for this kind of money. And in the case of some of those players, they believe they are worth more than that. And rightly so. They are worth more than that. Adam Duvall is worth more than $3 million. But it's supply and demand, it's the calendar, it's all these things working against them. Have you heard anything from ownership? Because players think, and that's, I think, how you should be as a player, that you are worth more than it. Is there, is there something from ownership that, you know what, we're okay with just filling in the pieces as, you know, your minor league free agents. If you want this job, you can have it for this amount that, you know what, it's not really worth it. You know, what, what Adam Duvall did last year's 21 homers, that's not worth it at all. Or Brandon Belt, that's not really worth it. Is that why? Or is it just strictly to just save money and say, that's eh, okay, we're just not driving the market up? Eric, I don't think it's the owners necessarily. It's the GMs. It's the presidents of baseball operations. And this is the way teams operate now. Many times they say just the way you described it. Well... Brandon Belt might give me this, but my kid might give me this. He's not worth the difference. And to me, that's a fallacy. That's false thinking. Brandon Belt had a really good year last year. Tommy Pham had a really good year last year. Michael Taylor, one of his best years in some ways, certainly from a home run perspective, and he's a great defender. Those are quality established major league players, okay? They're not kids who are going to come in and do the same thing that these guys can do. Sorry, it doesn't work like that. And I do not subscribe to that theory that you can get equivalent war from a youngster. Maybe you can, but it's got to be a pretty good youngster because these guys are, as I said, established, competent, qualified major league players. Now, the market is what it is, right? Every year, guys get squeezed. Every year we see players not forced into retirement, but choosing retirement because they don't want to play for the money being offered them. And I understand that from the player's perspective. I also understand it from the market's perspective. It is what it is in a sense. So for these players, it's just a really unfortunate circumstance right now. And I don't know what they were offered earlier in the offseason, if anything. I don't know if they could have played this better. But these guys, as I've said many times before on this program and my own, they should be in camp playing. They are major league players. Would, I know Boris is going to butt up against this and maybe even the Players Association would, would a deadline force teams to make their teams early 
in the sense that like, let's say we have the deadline December 20th, you can have a Christmas vacation, you know, other people can do their things, but now you don't really know what you're getting in your minor leaguer that's supposed to come in. Would that give a job to Adam Duvall, to Michael Lorenzen, to Brandon Belt? Because, hey, we got to make our decision, not in March when it's like, oh, I see who we got and we're good with who we got. Eric, the union's position and Boris's position certainly as well, and most agents' position, is that a deadline would be harmful, and maybe especially to those players. And if you look at the J.D. Davis circumstance, what just happened there, this was an arbitration case, okay? And the Giants, according to his agent, gave them an offer an hour before the deadline. They were squeezing him, and he chose not to take it. He goes to arbitration. We all know what happened. When you have deadlines, and this has happened in the amateur draft, Teams will use the clock to their advantage and squeeze players and at times make hard decisions on players. So I'm a believer that the offseason needs some adjustment. I don't know if a signing deadline is the adjustment. Maybe it's a trade deadline. And the owners would say, well, we're not giving you a trade deadline unless we have a signing deadline. I don't know the answer. Maybe there is no answer. But the pace of this offseason and the fact that we still have two pretty dominant starting pitchers out there, and it's March 15th. It's partly the responsibility of the agent, Scott Boris, no question about that. But it's also a mechanism of the system. The system allows for this, and this is where we are with these players. And it seems to be the case every year, where you see guys lingering and lingering and lingering. For the sports benefit, for an aesthetic benefit, A deadline and more action around the winter meetings would be great. Can you imagine a trade deadline at the winter meetings? It would be a frenzy. And yet we're not there, and I don't know that we're ever going to get there. How about a team like San Diego? I mean, they're they're like one outfielder away. So, I mean – why not an Adam Duvall or or a Tommy Pham? Like what – I know they just made that big – trade with Dylan Cease but is there an option for San Diego maybe to go after one outfielder which they desperately need I think in my opinion Todd I agree with you and they should be on one of those guys but as we've reported and talked about all winter they are under financial restrictions to some degree and the reason Dylan Cease was preferable to them than a free agent is because he's 8 million this year maybe 11 or 12 million next year in his final year of club control so a Tommy Pham or a Michael Taylor would make a lot of sense for them at this point. A lot of sense. They're going to go with a kid, Jackson Merrill in center field, who has impressed scouts and had a great spring. He's still unproven. He's playing a new position. He had like a 320 on base last year in the minors. I love when prospects come up. It's one of the best parts of the game, in my opinion. But let's face it. We don't know if he's going to succeed. Profar has an ankle injury now. We don't know how serious it is. Regardless, they need outfielders. And they made a great move, in my opinion, to get Cease and really shore up their rotation, put themselves in position to be potentially a wild card contender. But if they weren't under these financial restrictions, maybe they'd have that outfielder by now. As we know, Garrett Cole <clears throat> in trouble with the injury. I'm looking, in my opinion, probably around three months, you know, with all said and done. We'll see, whatever. Talk about free agency. Yeah, talk about free agency. There's a Michael Lorenzen out there, a guy that can be a starter and a reliever, like Scott said before. Why not Cashman go out and get a guy like that for the sole purpose you can put him in the bullpen and have him dominate there and make that bullpen even better? I'm with you. And to me, Michael Lorenzen makes a lot of sense for the Yankees right now. He's sort of a stopgap in the rotation. And, yes, he can do both roles. They don't want to pay Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery and essentially pay double, right? They're at the 110% luxury tax rate. So if you give Blake Snell $30 million, it's essentially $62 million, something along those lines. Uh, That's a lot of money for even Blake Snell. So Lorenzen, who would come at a much lower cost, would seem to me to make a lot of sense for them. And I would not be surprised to see them act. The White Sox are also on Lorenzen. They need rotation reinforcements now that Cease is gone, obviously. He's going to go at some point. He's probably going to benefit from all that is going on in the market with injuries and all these different things. But at the same time, these teams are looking at their pitching staffs and they have to feel that they need at least one more piece. Both those teams I just mentioned, not to mention any number of others. Houston, as Chandler Rome just wrote in The Athletic, 
they are perhaps in the mix for Blake Snell because they're dealing with some questions. Verlander and Javier and Valdez coming off off years for them. So it's kind of playing into the agent's hands, but at the same time, what teams at this point have $30 million a year to spend? Not many. Maybe it's Houston. Mm. Maybe there's another team out there, but that's the problem that Snell and Montgomery are running into. Ken, I'll mix in a fan question here. Michael said, can you ask where talks are between the Angels, Snell, J.D. Martinez, and we can just cover as a whole where the Angels are at and do we have any inclination that they're going to suddenly pop up and do something? I mean, in fairness, me personally, I think even if they did add one player, if they're not even close to a playoff team, they might realize that themselves. But I don't know what your perception has been of them this offseason, just adding a bunch of relievers. My understanding of where the Angels are, Scott, is that Perry Manajian, their GM, has been lobbying Artie Moreno all winter to sign a Blake Snell, maybe to sign a J.D. Martinez. And Artie Moreno has held fast and said, no, we're not doing at least Blake Snell to this point. Now, is it possible that it drops? Buster only of ESPN reported about, I don't know, a week ago that the Angels actually are Blake Snell's preference. That would seemingly indicate that maybe there's a chance there. But historically, Artie Moreno has not given long-term pitchers or long-term contracts to starting pitchers. He's invested in position players from Josh Hamilton to Albert Pujols to Anthony Rendon to, of course, Mike Trout. But he has not gone very often long-term with pitchers. I think C.J. Wilson was his biggest deal for a starter outside of Jared Weaver, who is an extension. So from that perspective, it would be somewhat out of character. And I'm with you, Scott. How do we know this team's any good even with Blake Snell? Because the entire thing, to me, hinges not just on their pitching, certainly that, but also the health of Trout and Rendon. If they're on the field, yeah, I can see the Angels competing for a wild card spot. Will they be on the field? That's the question. If there is one guy in Major League Baseball right now <clears throat> that can switch outfield to infield positions, the only guy I could think of that could play shortstop just like that would be Mookie Betts. I, I think, excuse me, got something caught there, but in my opinion, he's that guy that could do it. I think he's confident to do it. I know you wrote about this a little bit. This guy has all the confidence. We've seen him play second base. He's an athlete. You see him bowl. You see him do all these other things. This dude can do it. I believe in him. And you talked about him a lot at shortstop. And, and the game's coming up pretty soon, man. Talk about Mookie Betts and what he can bring to the table at shortstop. Well, this is a really interesting situation because the safe play for them would be to go with Miguel Rojas at short, Mookie Betts at second, right? They were planning to play Mookie at second. Miguel Rojas was their primary shortstop last year. Granted, he's 35, but he can handle that position. But they still believe in Gavin Lux as a bat. They believe he is going to hit Andrew Friedman, president of baseball operations, said he is special in the batter's box. They want him in the lineup. So they're playing him at second base. They're playing Mookie at short to get Gavin Lux's bat into the lineup. Now with Mookie, it's really interesting. He was originally a shortstop. Actually, he played all over the field, but he played shortstop. And in researching that article and reporting for it, I learned that he still kind of has a chip on his shoulder from when the Red Sox moved him off the position, which was really early in his minor league career, more than a decade ago. He still believes he can play it. He's also motivated by the idea of becoming only the second player to win a gold glove in the infield and the outfield. Darren Erstad is the only one to ever do that. So here's Mookie. He's a guy who, as Friedman described to me in the article, any challenge he has ever been given, he has succeeded at, and not only succeeded, but wildly succeeded. So I totally believe he can do it. Now, the question is, how good can he be and how quickly can he get better? Because the danger here, as I wrote, is that initially he might only be an average shortstop, a fringe average shortstop. Maybe he gets to average at some point. Maybe he gets to above average. But that's the challenge. The way it was described to me, that's more the challenge than whether it would detract from his offense. He compartmentalizes really well. And that's not going to be an issue. The physical part of it, if you were going to be worried about him physically at short, well, you should have been worried about him physically at second. Granted, short is a little bit more demanding. But remember, that's wanted to go to the infield to reduce the wear and tear on his body. So the question for me is how good can he be defensively and how much of an issue will it be in their infield? 
if you've got Max Muncy coming off a bad defensive year, but in much better condition and looking better. Mookie at short, essentially a new position. And then Lux at second. The Dodgers, they're going to need to play defense. And this is the question as we see them right now. Do they really need – is this – is this understanding? Oh, my bad, Scotty. <laughs> is this is this understanding the lineup that they've built? Like needing Gavin Lux in the lineup? Like, don't they have enough of an offense? And their pitching's gonna need the help. I mean, we saw an entire outing where Yamamoto gave up five balls in the infield and all five guys got on. Like don't they have enough on offense and say, Gavin Lux, we need you to figure it out. We're going to go Miguel Rojas. Or is this just doubling down on their strength and keeping the offense where it's at? It's a fair question, Eric. And it's one a lot of fans are asking too. Why are you going to this extreme when you don't necessarily have to? But keep in mind, they have other infielders in the mix as well. Kika Hernandez, Chris Taylor, they can do some different combinations. And, of course, Rojas is another option. So if it doesn't work with Lux, then some of these things we're talking about, maybe Mookie going back to second and Kike and Rojas playing short, becomes a more viable thing. But at this point in the spring, even though it is getting late for them, they want to look at Lux. They want to see if this can work. And they believe, and this is the question, right, that that combination – Bets and Lux gives them the best team overall. I'm not sure that's true. They're not sure that's true. But that's what they want as their first idea. If something else becomes more viable and more realistic and better for the team, they're going to do that. But this is the way they're looking at it right now. And to me, guys, it's one of the most interesting questions of the spring and entering the season, how this is all going to play out. They have a lot of bodies. It's just a matter of how they fit them in. Ken, the way I look at the Dodgers these days is everything is about the playoffs. They realize that they've had many opportunities. They've only come through to the end one time during the COVID season. So if I'm LA and Mookie can handle shortstop and Lux is an above average offensive player at second base, that makes them better for the postseason. If it does not work out, Willie Adamas, no big deal in a month or two. You know, I'm serious though. I mean, I think that they probably had conversations in the off season and the asking price was too high, but even with this Devin Williams injury added on top, the Brewers to me are looking less and less like a World Series contender, let alone even, I mean, I would say even a playoff contender at this point. So don't you think they go, hey, we've got a fallback plan. We're going to make the playoffs anyway. Scott, I think you're dead on with all of that. And I'm glad you bring up the possibility of Willie Adamas because the other option here, outside of all of those names I just mentioned, is at some point, if it's not working out the way they intended to or wanted to, you trade for a shortstop. Maybe it's Willie Adamas. Maybe it's some other player that we're not necessarily anticipating right now. They'll have the option to do that. So nothing is set in stone. And Dave Roberts issued that memorable line, this is permanent for now. And actually, that is an accurate assessment of where it is. It is permanent at the moment, but only for now. <laughs> I like it. That makes sense. All right, let's get to the St. Louis Cardinals. Ken, uh, you wrote about them and their pitching staff that you know need needs walkers, and you know they can't get on the field by themselves. I'm, I'm kidding, obviously, but people making fun of the fact that their staff is very MLB old. Yes. So, what is their response? The older, the better. <laughs> <laughs> they. We're very confident when I spoke to them. The four most veteran starters outside of Matt's, I'm talking about Michaelis and Lynn and Gibson and Sonny Gray. And they were almost defiant because I put it to them. I know all these guys, so I felt comfortable asking these questions. I basically was asking, how do you see the rotation and why should people believe it's going to be good? And each of them basically said, because we go deep into games. And Lance Lynn, as you might imagine, he's on our show regularly. He had a very pointed response. He said, we can eat innings. Young guys can't. They don't know how to do that. They're not taught to do that. We'll do it. And their thinking is, and I'm speaking for them as a whole here, kind of summarizing what they said, that the team's offense should be much better than it was last year. The defense, for whatever reason, was not good last year, but should be good again. And if they can go deep into games, the Cardinals have strengthened their bullpen with Keenan Middleton and Andrew Kittredge. So... 
They go deep into games. They give the team a chance to win. Doesn't have to be one nothing. Can be eight seven. But that's the, the working line of thinking. I'm skeptical of it. A lot of people are skeptical of it because it seems to me this plan would look a lot better if Blake Snell was at the top or if Jordan Montgomery was in the mix. And the Cardinals are not going to do either one of them. They made their moves early and they spent their money. But come the playoffs, if they make the playoffs, what's their rotation looking like then? And the pitchers I talked to, they acknowledge that's a question. And Sonny Gray, was it was really interesting talking to him. I said, Sonny, do you think you're an ace? And he said, I wouldn't have said earlier in my career, but yes, now I do believe I'm an ace. And he, in the postseason last year, had one good one, one bad one. He certainly can be that guy. But there are many, there are not many classic aces right now. He certainly doesn't qualify. There probably are only a handful in the game. So it's going to be a really interesting experiment with them, too, how this all works out. Lynn, last year, most homers allowed in the majors. It was a below-average season. Kyle Gibson, yes, pitched innings, but from an ERA perspective, when you adjust it to the league and the park, below average. We'll see. And these guys are all accomplished. They've all done really good things in their career. And, yes, they all can pitch innings, but they've got to be effective innings. And that's where the question lies. Maybe they'll have a chip on their shoulders too. No, right I mean, yes, I'm not picking them to make the playoffs right now. They do, right? Yeah. I I love the veterans. I I, I love the team has and they're salty too. They're like, you think of Lance Lynn, he's a salty veteran, and I love everything about it. <laughs> well, we're here for it. We'll have him on plenty, like Ken said. Ken, have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, guys. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy. Baseball, the way it should be covered.